Hello and welcome. This is a lecture review for the William Stallings Effective Cybersecurity First Edition book. Again, this is a lecture review using the material offered by the publisher Pearson View. All copyrights belong to them. This is for educational purposes only. Again, the textbook is Stallings. Effective Cybersecurity, a guide to using best practices and standards, first edition, done through Pearson View Education, ISB number, uh, ISB number 13-97801-3477-2806. So again, copyright belongs to the author and publisher. I am just doing lecture reviews on the PowerPoints for each of the individual chapters. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump on in. Chapter 3, Information Risk Assessment. The ultimate goal of risk or risk assessment is to enable an organization's management team and executives to determine an appropriate budget for security and for other resources. That way, they can look at the risk or likelihood of an occurrence and figure out what is the appropriate level of protection that is needed. So this objective is met by providing an estimate of the potential cost to the organization if a security issue occurs. That estimation is the likelihood of said security event. It is often thought that risk assessment should be pretty obvious, but indeed, there's a lot of necessity for it. It is well at the outset to be recognized its limitations. It is not going to be the end-all be-all type thing we are clearly summarizing some of the research within risk assessment throughout this chapter. If the scale of an effort is too ambiguous, projects become too large, complicated, scope, uh, creep, things like that, it becomes overwhelming or it becomes unreviewable, too tedious, thus no longer able to be quantified, or it just becomes too daunting of a task and then it's done. I've dealt with organizations that their risk assessment was so complicated, they only did it once every five years because it was so big of a hassle. So there are some best practices through the Information Security Forum's Standards of Goods and Practices for Information Security that make it easier and make it a, a more doable to conduct risk assessments most appropriately. NIST's also has a framework for conducting risk, uh, risk assessments that align a lot better to easeability while still hitting all of the major areas that need to be covered within a risk assessment. Again, the goal is to identify the risk, identify potential vulnerabilities, and then how to mitigate those risks to help build a better budget and help build a better uh, budget review process so that the appropriate costs for controls and protections are actually accounted for. All of this drives data-driven decision-making using risk, risk analysis, risk likelihood to justify costs. All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and jump in. So here we have our terms and definitions, uh, and we also have the definitions according to ISO 27005. Asset impact event, threat vulnerability, threat action, threat agent, security incident, risk, likelihood, level of risk, security controls, yada, yada, yada. A big part of this is you need to understand the terminology. 
That way we understand what we are talking about. I'm going to go through four of these terms. The rest of them you can uh, review by yourself. Asset, anything that's value to the organization, normally requires protection. Assets could be a physical or tangible asset or non-tangible asset. Data could be an asset. A computer, a server, a room could be an asset. Threat is a potential cause of unwanted incident which may result in the harm to an asset. So again, potential cause of unwanted incident causing harm. Vulnerability, a weakness of an asset or control that can be exploited by one or more threats. Risk is a combination of consequences of events associated with likelihood of occurrence. All right, last one is, um, let's go ahead and do event, occurrence or change of a particular set of circumstances. Those are pretty common, the four portions of risk that you need to at least understand. Risk analysis, risk criteria, risk evaluation, assessment, treatment management. Those come a little bit later, but understanding assets, threats, what risk means, uh, vulnerabilities, uh, threats, events, those are all really good foundation concepts. Risk assessment in its whole is a complex subject, so we're not going super in depth. We're kind of keeping it high level. So to begin looking at risk assessment, look at terminology. And then we can also look at how that relates to the NIST standard. That'd be NIST SP830, Guides for Conducting Risk Assessment. Or there's also the X1055, Risk Management and Risk Profile Guidelines for Telecommunication Organizations. Again, most of these definitions are pretty similar across the board. Also, these are guidelines for an organization. They are not step-by-step -step guides. They are guidelines, not step-by-step -step walkthroughs. So once you have a good grasp of our terminology, then we can start diving in deeper. All right, so let's look at our threats and vulnerabilities a little bit more. So threats and vulnerabilities need to be considered together. They are not exclusive. A threat is the potential of a threat agent or international or intentional uh, accidental or, or whatever the case may be, exploit uh, a vulnerability. So essentially, the threat is that potential. A vulnerability is that weakness. So a vulnerability, weakness in a system, a procedure, a policy, code, design, uh, control, whatever the case may be. A threat actor normally is going to be acting on a vulnerability to produce a security violation. Normally called a breach, but it doesn't have to be a breach. The level of risk is measured so that organization can use uh, that information in assessing the need. For example, we can look at what's the likelihood of someone breaching a file server. What we would look at is likelihood of that breach, what controls are currently in place, and what is the cost of the, the data on that file server? If it is non-important, non-critical data, it may not be worth very much. So we would then use that information to determine likelihood, what we're willing to pay to protect that server, and ensure that it is cost effective. If the data on the server costs $20,000, and to protect that file server costs $40,000. Well, at that point, it may not be worth it to secure the server. And that risk assessment is going to give us that information. Now, normally that is not the case. Normally, the data that we're looking at or the asset we're looking at protecting typically is going to be more expensive than the cost of protecting, but you actually need to review it just to make sure. Because I've definitely been in situations where it was cheaper not to protect certain things because of the organization or because of asset uh, management or some 
reasoning for that organization. So do definitely keep that in mind. All right, so let's look at what that means. So here we have a graphic where we have assets and threats, vulnerabilities and controls. So I'm actually gonna grab my marker. So when we're looking at a threat, we're looking at both impact and likelihood because if the impact is high, but the likelihood is low, well, we're gonna to have to look at what's the likelihood. If it is a low impact, but high likelihood, we still have to address it. So when we're looking at the uh, these avenues, normally asset comes first. Asset has to be, what is the impact of that asset? If we lost control of that asset, is it data, is it a, a system? If the data is compromised or if the system is compromised, what impact does that have to the business? Let's say we have a workstation that's compromised. The impact could be fairly high. So that means once we know the impact, we can assess it based off of the level of risk. If it is a high impact and it is a high likelihood, it's probably a high level of risk. But we look at the impact of an event, both assets and threats, essentially against the business. And we also look at likelihood. And that is likelihood, we're looking at the threat, the vulnerability, and the mitigation or controls that might prevent or reduce likelihood. So we look at both impact and likelihood, and both of those help dictate the level of risk. Could be low, could be medium, could be high. It really just depends on the situation. So this is our typical process that we would go to review. And again, this is a figure in our in the textbook that kind of helps walk us through the level of risk. So what does all of this relate? All of this goes back to impact. So the two main elements for impact are assets and threats. Assets again are physical, tangible or non-tangible like information and data. And we should always have an inventory of our assets. Realistically, this is where most businesses fail is because they don't always have a good grasp of what assets they have. Next, we need to look at the threats of each asset. Determine all of the appropriate threats to an asset. Look at how we can mitigate or reduce the threats. And we can also look at the ways that threats could reduce the value of an asset. If there is a computer, a threat could be a surge. A surge might destroy components of the system, which would then lower the value of the assets. So it really just kind of depends on what you are looking at and how you're, you're framing what uh, your assets are. A threat could also be accidental deletion. After that, we have likelihood. That's typically risk. So when we're looking at likelihood of something happening, we have three main considerations. Threats, vulnerabilities, and controls. Threats, again, uh, are each individual asset, what uh, threats are relevant, what threats need to be considered. So, for example, when we are looking at potential, uh, maybe we are looking at what's the potential of a tsunami in Las Vegas. Well, that the threat there, what might be uh, a natural event, natural occurring event, flooding our workspace in Las Vegas. Well, yeah, I mean, that that's possible. Super unlikely. So does this need to be considered? Probably not. So we would then move on. So part of when we're identifying threats, identify all threats, and then also rank likelihood of which ones to be considered. That way, anyone that is not necessary we can remove. After that, vulnerabilities, and that is for each of the threat to an asset, determine the level of vulnerability. That is determine the specific for an asset, now a threat could be achieved. How could a threat actually be realized? So if we're going back with the natural phenomenon, for us in Las Vegas to have a tsunami, that probably means something major would have to happen in the, the Pacific, or California coast drop into the ocean. Again, 
probably unlikely, but I mean, it, it might happen. And then controls would be what measures or what controls can we put in place to reduce the risk? Remember, to determine how likely a threat action can cause harm, base this on the likelihood of the threat action and the effectiveness of the control. If we want to look at a different example, we could look at uh, a car. Car is the asset. The threat could be theft. Vulnerabilities are what vulnerabilities are attached to the car. Well, maybe the make and model have certain high uh, vulnerabilities because of key entry. Well, if you do a club, does the club, uh, the actual steering wheel control protection, does that reduce the vulnerability so that the likelihood of the threat is mitigated? And in that regard, it, it might be. So impact and likelihood, this is the level of risk is determined as the combination of the cost of the threat occurring combined with the likelihood of the threat occurring. That way, we can kind of look at how to reduce potential or likelihood of a threat being realized. The important part here is we have to understand that we have to look at risk, the asset, likelihood of occurrence, and actually what it's going to cost because it makes no sense to protect something that the value is so low. And the low is very relative. I mean, if it's going to cost, you know, $20,000 to protect a $5 item, is, is it worth it? And that's the question we have to ask when we're doing our risk analysis. So what are some challenges? First of all, it's really hard to estimate and really hard to predict things. Some things you can quantify, they're more tangible. Some things like reputation, well, it's a lot harder to estimate the value of your reputation. It can be done, but it is a lot more difficult. So when we're doing some of this, we have to keep that in mind. So within, the esti uh, within an estimation, we have to look at the asset, the threat, the vulnerability, and the controls. All of these go into the problem of how we estimate. So we we'll have to look at the value of the asset, the difficult, uh, the difficultiness of some of the threats, the vulnerability, uh, again, facing the organization, facing the asset itself, and there might be some vulnerabilities that we're not even aware of that we're having to uh, accommodate. And again, controls. It may be very difficult to assess the effectiveness of a certain control unless it's implemented, unless you might have other organizations that implement it, or unless it's the best practice. So all of these kind of impact directly the ability to estimate the potential cost correctly. So why though? Like why are these areas so hard to estimate? For assets, for example, a organization has to have a realistic value for an asset. That way you can figure out how to reduce that specific threat based off of that value. The threat in this example is determining the threat facing that organization through past experiences, past likelihoods, past uh, sectors, for example, because again, if you're a power company, you're going to look at what threats other power companies have faced in that same type of asset category. Uh, maybe look at your region, because honestly, sometimes those organizations might face a higher threat level depending on what industry they're in. So we want to look at historical data and look at what threats are possibly out there. We have our vulnerabilities, and that's, again, an organization has to face a security vulnerabilities that they're not aware of. You can do the assessment all you want, but there's always going to be things that get through. So you have to do your due diligence the best you can. Not just do patches, not just scan occasionally, implement an appropriate framework so that you can better protect yourself. Next would be control. And again, controls are implemented to reduce vulnerabilities, at least the ones that you're aware of. So the ones that you're not aware of, you can't really mitigate because, well, you're not made aware of them. So that kind of looks at the issues with estimating. 
Part of estimating is also then looking at how to predict future conditions. So this is another huge challenge. Again, with assets, you have to plan uh, the period over a one-year, two-year, three-year, five-year plans. And these may change the value as the organization changes. Also, there might be compliance requirements. So there are some complexities when we're estimating the impact of these assets or, or threats based off of these assets. Whether it's software, whether it's hardware, whether it's intellectual property, the prediction is now complex because we're now looking at time periods. With threat, again, it's difficult to, to best assess the current threat capabilities and the intentions. Because again, when we're looking at this, it's a certain level of uncertainty and there's new types of threats every day. So what's the threat level going to be in a one year, two, three, five year type cycle? With vulnerabilities, again, the changes within the organization, within the assets, within the management, with the unexpected vulnerabilities, all of this then adjusts the ability for predicting that condition. So vulnerabilities may also then change and new vulnerabilities may be found. Lastly is control. New technologies, new hardware, new software, new controls might provide opportunities for mitigation uh, might strengthen your protection or might even weaken your protection. It really just depends. So it is very difficult to predict because prediction in itself is difficult. Based off of the nature of these opportunities, based off of the cost, resource allocations, may not always be optimal for protection. So predicting future conditions, it's a challenge. So that also then needs to be addressed. That's where the risk management frameworks come into play. So again, we have our NIST standard for SP-837 that provides the risk management framework for information systems and organizations. And basically that just kind of defines risk management, what it includes, the discipline, the structure, the process development for optimizing the organizational asset evaluation, security and protection control mechanisms, uh, implementation guidelines, the assessment uh, structure, system and controls, and monitoring. It also includes an enterprise level activity uh, that should be included to kind of help better prepare organizations to execute and conduct regularly this risk assessment and this risk management. That way it's a continual process. So building the framework at the system level of the organization so that it's easily repeatable. And here is a typical risk management life cycle. The first step is assess risk based on assets, threats, vulnerabilities, and existing controls. Look for inputs, determine impact and likelihood, as well as the level of risk. Next step, level two, identify potential security controls to reduce risk and prioritize the use of these controls. Step three, allocate resources, roles, responsibilities, and implement controls. Step four, monitor, evaluate, create effectiveness, and repeat if necessary. The result of the final steps are fed back into the next iteration of the life cycle, and you repeat, and you keep going through the process forever. There isn't an end. You keep cycling this process. Here we have an example of ISO 25005, the risk management process. While a simpler risk analysis worksheet may be suitable for smaller organizations, for larger organizations it may not be that easy. So we may actually have a formalized risk assessment, which may include identification, analysis, evaluation, and then some type of treatment. Treatment could also then lead into acceptance or review, and then rinse and repeat. Again, these are always being evaluated. It's not one and done. It is once you cycle through the system, you repeat and you keep repeating as time goes forward or as necessary. So let's look at the ISO 27005 a little bit more in depth. So again, the context here is this is a management function that involves settling 
that for the basic criteria necessary for information risk management, defining the scope, boundaries, establishing all the appropriate policies and procedures and structure for risk management. Risk criteria are based on the organizational objectives, both internal and external context. They are also derived from standards, regulations, laws, policies, procedures, and any other lawful requirements. Risk assessment, uh, basically the ISO 27001 will define risk assessment as consisting of three main activities. Risk identification, and that involves identifying a uh, risk source, risk event, causes, and their potential consequences. Risk analysis, which provides the basis for risk evaluation and decisions about risk treatment. That also includes risk analysis for risk estimation. And the risk evaluation, which assists in the decision about risk treatment by comparing the results of risk analysis and risk criteria to determine whether the risk and or magnitude are acceptable or tolerable for the organization. Then we also have risk treatment, which involves things like avoiding risk or deciding not to start or continue an activity that might even raise the risk, uh, taking or increasing risk in order to pursue an opportunity. Sometimes to pursue that opportunity might increase or uh, potentially decrease risk, but really just uh, it depends. Or risk treatment can also mean removing a risk source. Does that device need internet access? Could we give it no internet access? And that could be part of the risk treatment portion. So in this table, we are looking at categories and considerations. So purpose of risk, risk evaluation, and impact, and risk acceptance. Sometimes it is okay to accept risk. Sometimes when we're looking at defining risk, at what level are we comfortable with saying, okay, I'll handle that type of risk. When you leave your house every day and get into a car, you run the risk of getting in a car accident. So at what level are you okay with getting into a car accident? If you have reduced your risk as much as possible at a certain point, you just accept that that might be an outcome. Not necessarily is the outcome, but it could be potential. So we will try to minimize our exposure the best we can, thus making our risk hit an acceptable limit. So that actually the key thing here is understanding risk acceptance criteria. Another area is the impact criteria, because that's kind of be dealt with like the level of classification and how we deal with uh, informational assets. That could also bring things like loss of business and financial value. And that could also mean loss of reputation. Because that's a big thing is some of those are non-tangible. How do you calculate loss of business? Well, I mean, that you can quantify. How do you quantify potential loss of business? If we are closed next month, how much money will we lose? Well, we don't actually know. We can estimate it. Maybe looking at past trends but that's not guaranteed to be an accurate number. Uh, What about reputation? How do you calculate loss of reputation? So there are things in in here that we have to review and uh, look at that's not always straightforward. That's why risk management and risk assessment are complex topics, and normally these are specialists-type areas. We also have virtual machines, so again, Uh, Software that will virtualize another operating system. That's typically what we use uh, VMs for. And that way we can have uh, individual or independent operating systems that are housed inside a physical hardware box. Uh, You can do more applications. You can isolate uh, software within each computer, each guest. A virtual machine will enable different operating systems to run on the same physical equipment. So you might have one machine that then virtualizes a Windows 10, a Ubuntu, a Mac, uh, Apple OS X operating system. And that way you have different browsers, you have different uh, platforms that you can test off of, or maybe they're actually running critical uh, systems 
it really just depends. But again, a virtual machine typically is the sharing of physical resources between one or more virtualized operating systems. So sometimes the virtual machine isn't a hardware asset, but I mean it is a computer asset. So sometimes assets, even when we say computer, doesn't necessarily mean a physical machine. So with that said, identifying risk as it implements uh, against assets is kind of important. So the first step in risk assessment is to document and determine the value of all of the assets. First, honestly, is to identify all of the assets. And then after you identify the assets, you can determine the value. And that means of all assets. And that's something that most organizations struggle with. After we have an assessment of all of the assets, anything of uh, value to the business that requires protection would then need to be assessed. What levels of protection have to be there? Third would be the challenges in deploying some type of uniform way of documenting the assets, the controls, uh, the costs, and keeping it fluid amongst all of the assets. Fourth would be asset evaluation and relating directly to its business requirements or business goals. Basically, if we identify an asset, maybe a server that houses data, what's the value of the data based off of the business requirements, business needs, and business goals? And then we should be able to calculate that. And again, this is not as straightforward or as easy as it may seem. There are metrics and measures that are used to do the cal and formulas to do the calculations because these are pretty complex to calculate. Lastly would be the input of the asset valuation will need to be provided by the owner and the custodians of that asset, not the member of the risk team. The custodian of the asset would dictate the value of the asset, not the risk assessment team. For example, might be hardware assets. That's going to be computers, laptops, mobile devices, uh, communication equipment, workstations, peripheral equipment, phones, all of that fun stuff. These are things that are tangible. Key concerns are loss of the device, theft, damage to the device. If you have a cell phone, for example, it being stolen, that's a concern. It being destroyed because if you crushed it or dropped it, that's a concern. A lack of availability of that device. So if you destroy the device, are you going to get a brand new one? Are you going to get a used one? How quickly does that happen? All of that comes in as concerns. Is there a set of malfunction functionality? If you have a phone and you update it and it starts malfunctioning, how do you recover? Is there a way to, to work with the manufacturer to ensure your protection of your assets? And sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes the answer is no. It really just depends. The physical, the hardware-based assets, you can actually uh, value based off of the need of the organization, but also the replacement costs. Uh, the, 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 that might include the disruption costs, the recovery expense. If I'm without a, a computer for 10 days, well, that is a disruption loss. Because if I'm out of a laptop, and I can't work for 10 days, that's lost productivity, that will also have to be factored into the evaluation of the cost of that hardware. We also have other types of virtualization, such as containers, smaller, more lightweight than a virtual machine, that can be kind of built on the fly. This technique in which underlining the operating environment so that the code could be virtualized. Pretty common now, within the system kernel of most operating systems. This does result in isolated containers and applications. Thus, if an application crashes, it doesn't crash the entire system. For most workstations, it's kind of not relevant, but for a server, for example, it is extremely relevant. If an application crashes on a server, it may not always be the best opportunity to restart the server. So being able to container to uh, actually pipe those virtual applications into small containers 
makes it a little bit easier to handle. That way, if an application does crash, it doesn't affect the entire system. We also have other software-defined portions. So we have software-defined operating systems, software-defined infrastructure. We also have software-defined networking called SDN. And this approach allows us to build and design large networks based off of programming and forwarding decisions and routers and switches via software that's virtualized. That brings us to the next section of network function virtualization. Sometimes higher level equipment will virtualize components of the networking functions to provide better scalability. This approach is designing and building and operating large scale networks based off of programming. Again, looking at forwarding decisions of routers and switches through a centralized server. SDN differs from traditional networking by requiring the software to be configured separately on each device. Software defined networking is just that, networking that's running on software. Where networking, the traditional sense is hardware running software that would be dedicated hardware uh, equipment. What does get really interesting is when we're talking about SDNs and uh, NFVs, that does bring up software assets. Because software assets, well, that's applications, operating systems, virtual machines, virtualized software, SDNs, NVF. These are going to be the software related assets that we don't always consider. So uh, VMs, containers, all of those would be software based assets. After that, we have information assets that could be uh, service information or operational information or standard practices, user manuals, user awareness training manuals, calling patterns, billing uh, patterns, training patterns, uh, business plans, business continuity plans, business impact plans, audit information, research information, intellectual property. This could be so much more. While ITUT does define several things like communication data, writing information, subscriber information, and so forth, this is going to be pretty much information as a whole. So all of this, including information and intellectual property, are all information-based assets. So what do we do with this? Well, we build a matrix. We can figure out the cost of uh, revelation, verification, cost of loss, and then we could then categorize them high, medium, low, and we would do that for every single piece of asset. What would happen if, to my business if this was made public or if this was lost or if this was realized outside, in, inside the company and outside the company? What would happen to my business if customer or I couldn't access this information? That's all great examples of things we have to consider when we're building out this matrix. We also have a business asset, and we're going to be looking at business asset categories, uh, in human resources, business processes, physical uh, equipment, physical plants, office space, things like that. And then lastly, categorized such as intangible assets, controls, knowledge, reputation, because a big part of business are, is your reputation. If you are known for a specific product and then all of a sudden you can't do that product anymore, does that hurt your brand? Even your branding is a business asset. The image of the organization is an asset. So all of that has to be accounted for when we are looking at our different types of assets. So you're noticing these assets just keep climbing. We're not just talking network assets or computer assets or desk assets. Assets are pretty huge throughout an organization. And that typically is why we have some form of asset register. That way we can kind of centralize our methodology for collecting information on those assets. This provides a systematic method of documenting assets 
security implications, possible values, and that way we can actually track everything. That way we can make sure we are accounting for all of the different types of assets. This is done for uh, so that we have documentation. And when we're looking at major compliances, this is typically a step. So examples of items might be an asset name and description, type, risk assessment, information assessment, uh, owner and custodian assessment, location, function, process function, data, data type, date, uh, value classification, uh, exposure level, disaster recovery level, when's the last time it was refreshed. Some assets are needing to be refreshed more than others. Uh, when was it installed? When was it last worked on? When was it updated? It really depends on the type of asset, but there are different ways to classify more and more of this information. Sometimes you need to know when a computer is purchased, when it should be retired, what access it uh, might have. Uh, if, if it's personnel, if it's client, if it's PII, personal information, uh, personal identifying information, are there classifications? Is it a physical server? Is it a virtual server? Is it being updated regularly? When it was the last time it was reviewed for protection? And so forth. Is there a disaster recovery plan for it? What level of importance is that asset in the grand scheme of things to the organization? If we're looking at impact, what impact does it have on the organization? If we have a server go down and we have a mainframe go down, well, what's the higher priority? So some of these assets will actually be prioritized. The descriptions and the exposure level are also really important. So this is just an example of how we might classify some of our assets or why we might collect that asset information in some type of registry-based system. So next we have to talk about threat identification based off of those assets. So threat identification is again that process of figuring out the sources of potential harm to that asset. There are three main categories, hostile actors, business-based resources, and environmental. Environmental are normally acts of God, floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, tsunamis, things like that. Business resources are equipment failures, supply chain issues, um, employees or vendors accidentally doing harm, accidents. Uh, hostile actors are hacktivists, uh, insider threats, external threats, criminals, nation states, cyber attacks, teenagers, so forth. Teenagers being in the sense of like hackers and activists. Both environmental and business resource threats must be recognized and addressed, but the bulk of the effort of the threat identification is in of risk assessment and risk mitigation and risk management involves dealing with the threats from hostile actors. While you still need to worry about business resources and environment, hostile actors are a major area. For environmental, you can focus more on recovery, earthquakes and floods and whatnot, versus hostile actors, you have to be a little bit more proactive because of just their nature. There are some stride threat model attempts. That would be stride, spoofing, tampering, uh, reputation, information, denial of service, and ev uh, evaluation. Well, the nice thing is spoofing identities. That's going to be an example of spoofing. Uh, tampering with data, data tampering. Uh, repudiation is basically repudiation threats are associated with the users who deny performing an action without other parties having any ways to prove that. Uh, user performing an illegal operation uh, and they can dispute it. Uh, repudiation. Non-repudiation would be they have no way of disproving that they did not commit the action. Information disclosure could be a data breach. Denial of service would be for attacking or preventing authorized or valid users from accessing a resource that's relevant. Relevant security controls in the area of availability, essentially. 
uh, escalation of privilege. Basically, if you have a non-privileged account, they can escalate their privileges to gain additional privileges to perform certain types of attacks. Or maybe they need to increase their privilege to perform some type of function. Threat types, malware, spyware, ransomware, uh, exploits, uh, password attacks, phishing. There's thousands of different types of attacks. Malware and viruses are big ones. Spam is a big one. Exploits are big ones. Adware or just scareware or where in general. Um, Keyloggers, social engineering, people, breathing, all types of threats. And these are just some of the threats. If we were talking physical assets, we could also talk about physical threats. Uh, it could be theft. So, I mean, there are many, many types of threats out there. So, let's look at sources of information. It's difficult to get reliable information, especially on past content. So, we do need to keep that in mind. So, organizations are often very reluctant to report security events, branding, and reputation is always a concern. So, oftentimes, organizations just try to ignore it or hide it. Some attacks are carried out, uh, or at least attempted without being detected. So, sometimes victims don't even realize they're the target of an attack or are a victim until much later, if they ever find out. Threats continue to evolve. Adversaries always adapt. New security controls and new techniques are always being developed. This is a never-ending process. So we have to keep informed on what's going on. There are sometimes fusion centers that are out there, government organizations that work with private sector individuals. So there's always ways to get current information on security events, as long as you're being active. So some of the other areas are in-house experience, that's going to be the security team's uh, experience, security alert services, so it could be blogs, it could be articles, it could be a fusion center, it could be local government, uh, the, any way that you're able to gain access to security alerts. And there's also global threat advisors, as go, uh, global threat surveys, that are also readily available. That kind of point to where certain types of attacks are coming from, where certain types of attacks are going, what organizations are starting to see, to kind of try to thwart some of this cyber attacks that are occurring. So sometimes they are industries that are collecting and sharing information with other industry partners to prevent or to, to minimize these types of attacks. And what's really interesting is there's organizations out there that are international based organizations that share this information. A big one is like the Ver, uh, Verizon Data Breach Investigation Reports. They actually come in a physical bound book. Uh, there's also an e-version as well, but they're really important. They provide annual data breach information and investigative reports. This authority are highly respected reports based on actual data incidents, systematically collecting from a wide array of organizations. And I've actually uh, had some of the investigators that I've worked with, and they've actually been pretty amazing. Uh, part of it could be patterns, could be actions, could be assets, and they identify the entire breach process. Again, uh, they cover a wide array of industry sectors. They look at patterns, action, and assets. And since 2018, the reports are based off of data from several tens of thousands of security uh, uh, incidences. This is, these are typically pretty hefty breach reports, but it's not the only breach report. There are several breach reports that are out there. So... The Verizon reports define the security incidents as security events that cover the CIA spectrum. They define a breach as an incident that results in confirmed disclosure, not just potential, but actually confirmed. And again, the reports summarize key pieces of information, actors, tactics, common factors. Given that wealth of high-quality data, this is a really great 
process, a really great tool uh, to implement at uh, the review so that the processes that can be implemented in your organization are actually there. The tactics, how did an organization get breached? Understanding how attackers are attacking businesses at least provide you a way to be a little bit more in control of what's going on in your network. If you see people in your industry, in your sector, being attacked one specific way, you may want to invest in better controls in that avenue. So the Threat Horizon Report, again, is a useful complement to the Verizon Report. This is the annual Threat Horizon Report of the ISF. The reports differ in a few different ways. It is more broad uh, brush treatment, identifying key threats. The Threat Horizon Report also attempts to project the likelihood of major threats over the next normally four quarters. The Threat Horizon is 2019 highlights, nine major threats broken down into challenges, themes, and organized into areas that you can expect to see growth over the next several years. You can also be looking at disruption, distortion, and uh, deterioration of certain areas. Again, they just kind of break this up into main categories. In disruption, again, likely due to over-resilience on a fragile connectivity requirements. Major threats would be uh, premeditated internet outages, ransomware, privilege inside in an attack. Distortion could be a, a trust of an attack. Uh, and integrity of information is lost. Major threats are automated misinformation, uh, falsifying information, subverting blockchain, shattering trusts. Deterioration, again, controlling, may be eroded by uh, regulations, technology bringing a heightened focus on risk assessment and management in light of regulatory challenges that increase prevalence of AI. Major threats are surveillance laws, privacy regulations, and AI-based deploying and unexpected outcomes. Notice blockchain information. Blockchain is a data structure that makes it possible to create a digital ledger of transactions and share it. And this essentially makes it harder to fake information because it's a digital ledger that is shared. Here we have a Top cybersecurity threat report. We can see the trends, whether they're increasing, decreasing, or stabilizing, and they cover main types of threats. Exploit kits, espionage, spam, denial of service, malware, and so forth. We also have a kill chain, which is different than many of the things that we discussed. A kill chain is a systematic process used to target and engage an adversary did it create a desired effect? Basically, it is the step-by-step -step playbook that typically malware is done. The general phases of a kill chain is reconnaissance, weaponization, delivery, exploit, installation, command and control, and actions. Basically, these are the common seven steps that almost every malware takes. And if you know the steps, you can kind of see what's going on for a potential attack. If you happen to see basic reconnaissance happening on your network, you could go, oh, well, this is the first step of this malware. Let's try to thwat it. Let's try to prevent it. Let's try to stop it in its tracks so we can prevent future escalation. So maybe we try to prevent the weaponization or delivery after the reconnaissance. So that's how we use the phases of a kill chain. We also have our operational centers that would be monitoring what's going on in our network, in our infrastructure, in our business to facilitate, track, and prevent, analyze, using analysts to review, to kind of see what's happening on your assets so that you know what's happening, so that you can mitigate them. They could also then look at recommendations for increased protection. Normally, this is where you're going to be doing your log analysis or having analysts do your log, uh, log analysis. That way, you can see what's happening in your network to then mitigate whatever is 
actively happening. Maybe you see a recon attack. Well, when you see the logs and you see that recon attack, you could be active. You might be, oh, well, it's coming from this address. Let's block this address. You are going to be in the operational center. That would be then preventing basic types of attacks. There are global reports as well. Things like the Trustwave Global Report. It's an annual report based on findings from extensive data sources, from number of security operation centers that break down types of data, asset targeted, mean time, intrusion uh, processes, breakdown of vulnerability and exploitation. And the report also looks at detailed breakdown of how various attacks were carried out, looking at the kill chain. We also have a Cisco annual report. Again, another great resource for threat information. You also have fusion centers that share threat information. So there's many, many, many threat reports that are out there. Uh, Fortinet has one as well, all geared towards sharing what's happening so that industry sectors know how to prevent attacks or how to mitigate attacks the best that they can. All of that ties into control identification. If you know where your gaps are, if you know where attackers are coming in typically, you can implement appropriate controls and then prevent those attacks. Controls are typically broken down into a few different categories. Administrative, technical, management or legal based controls. In reality, the three main categories, administrative, technical or logical or physical based controls. And the controls can identify the processes or the plans or the suggestions for increasing your security. Normally that means starting with administrative controls, reviewing documentation, policies, procedures, and guidelines, checking with the appropriate responsible parties, and conducting uh, reviews, and then audits, and reviewing the controls again, and implementing new controls if necessary, and repeating the process as necessary. Controls are, could be all over the place. The NIST 80 or 853 recommended uh, controls are broken down into many areas. Access control, auditing and accountability, training and awareness, configuration management, uh, contingency planning, identification, authentication, incident response, maintenance, media protections, personnel uh, protection, physical and environmental protections, planning, program management, risk assessment, security assessment and authorization, system communication and protection, system information integrity, system service acquisition, and more. So these are just some of the controls that are outlined in the NIST 8053 that normally organizations are reviewing for better protection. Though there are other types of risk analysis based documents. There's things like the FAIR risk analysis, FAIR being the factor analysis of information risk. It does group controls in the main categories, avoidance controls, deterrent controls, vulnerability controls, and responsive controls. And uh, again, avoidance, these are controls that uh, affect the frequency or likelihood. Deterrent are controls that affect the likelihood of a threat acting in a manner that results in harm. Vulnerability are controls that affect probability that a threat actor will result in loss. Response for controls are affects the amount of loss that result from threat actions. So avoidance controls could be firewall filters, physical barriers, relocation of assets, uh, things that uh, reduce the uh, threat population. Deterrent controls could be policies, monitoring, enforcement of practices, hardening and physical obstacles. Vulnerability controls could be authentication, access privileges, patches, configuration settings. Responsive controls could be forensics, incident response, monitoring, and backup and restoration processes. You're going to notice a thing, a theme here is there are many different groups, many different frameworks. Here we have a NIST IR 7621. 
broken down into five main categories, which are identity, detect, response, protect, and recover. Identity is identifying and control who has access to what. Protect is limiting access to only those that are necessary. Detect are things like installing and maintaining appropriate patches. Response is, again, responding to a security incident or disaster. Recovery is our backup process and how to actually recover. And again, the, the FAIR and NIST IR controls provided here are just some of the ideas. They're not the end all be all. They're just some of them as we are getting through managing cybersecurity functions and assessments. All right, moving on, we have our vulnerability identification. Vulnerability identification is the process of identifying vulnerabilities. What things can exploit or what things can be exploited by threats or by uh, harmful threat actors to cause harm to any specific type of asset. A vulnerability is a weakness, a flaw, a concern. Basically, it also uh, focus on things like design and implementation and controls that can be triggered uh, if uh, something is exploited. We're going to start looking at developing categories of vulnerabilities and discussing approaches to identify and document vulnerabilities. And we're going to look at things like the National Vulnerability Database. Now, keep in mind, these are not always technical vulnerabilities. These are not always technical threats. Sometimes vulnerability could be a physical vulnerability. If I have a computer that's left on a desk, could I break a window and steal it? That, that could be the vulnerability. The threat would be theft. All right, so let's look at our vulnerability categories. Technical vulnerabilities, human-caused vulnerabilities, and physical and environmental vulnerabilities. Physical access contro uh, controls, poor uh, seating of equipment, uh, in inadequate uh, environmental controls, things like that. That's going to be the physical and environmental variables. For our human-caused vulnerabilities, that's going to be uh, dependencies, gaps in awareness, gaps in enforcement, and honestly, improper hiring and termination processes. I've actually... Uh, have gone through several organizations that did not have proper termination so when they would let an employee go the employee would still have access weeks or months after the uh, termination we also have things like technical vulnerabilities that would be flaws in design and implementation of hardware software controls we also have things like operational vulnerabilities and that's lacks of change management uh, inadequate separation of duties. These are going to be more operational procedures and guidelines. And we also have a business continuity and compliance vulnerability section. Basically, that's uh, not having the appropriate controls in place to meet continuity and compliance based requirements. So that could also be inadequate business continuity planning and things like that. So a big part of this goes on vulnerability. Well, is there a way to organize vulnerabilities? There, is there a place to centralize vulnerabilities? Yes, there is. Here's an example of a vulnerability scoring example. It will list the current uh, description or issue. And this is part of the National uh, Vulnerability Database, the NVD. And it also then gives it a common vulnerability scoring system, a VCSS. And essentially, this is a comprehensive list of known technical vulnerabilities in systems, hardware, software, and so forth. The CVSS provides an open framework for communicating the characteristics of the vulnerability. It will define the vulnerabilities as bugs or flaws or weaknesses or exposures, uh, and what are they targeting? Applications, system devices, services, and so forth. But it gives you also severity, an impact score, and it gives you details and where and when it was identified. 
here we have a CVSS matrix. We can look at the attack vectors, complexity requirements, the impacts, the uh, temporal groups, the remediation levels, and so forth. And they provide us the metrics, none, low, medium, or high. That way, as we work through them, we can see maybe where we have to implement what controls, or if we even have to implement a control. Here we have a cost analysis versus risk assessment. We would then look at the cost of a breach versus the cost of control, and we are looking for an optimal level for our costs. Here we have different ways to identify our risk, quantitatively, qualitatively. Quantitatively is a statistical analysis based off of hard factual numbers. Quantitatively are less accurate, but it is more of a quantifiable way of identifying risk. You cannot quantify reputation loss. There isn't a easy calculation that will do that based off of future numbering. That's a qualitative way of finding out what's going on. Quantitatively is, again, looking at prioritizing financial impacts or asset data, historical data, things that can be expressed in specific terminology based off of historical trends. Quantitatively is more of a visibility of risk, easier to, to reach a consensus, and it's not as metric-based. Normally, quantitatively will be hard numbers. Quantitatively will be typically the low, medium, or high value-based. Here we have an impact category. Again, we have our low, or moderate, medium, or high. And again, expectations. And we also then have the causes of certain things. And this is just an impact category-based system. You can dive deeper into these. So we'll cover the main categories. Low, for example, is expected to have a limited adverse effect on the organization. Moderate or medium is expected to have some serious adverse effect to the organization. High is expected to have a severe or catastrophic adverse effect on the organization. So that way we have a way to organize the impact. There's other documents, things like our FIP guidelines, that will deal with impact assessment. These are going to be dealing with a, a low, medium, high based score, as outlined by our NIST 800-100 for uh, managers. Basically, this allows us to figure out what type of confidence. So uh, a confidence would be a high, or integrity would be moderate, or availability we could then identify what uh, information is there. So normally we're looking at confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Those are three main categories. So when we're looking at an asset, we can see things like uh, what is the vulnerability versus threat capability uh, asset in terms of availability, uh, integrity, and confidentiality. We also have things like our PII, personal identifiable information. This could be anything that identifies an individual. Our impact is basically reviewing the impact of concerns. So is it a impact to the business? Is there an exposure to, uh, to an assets? So if we're looking at business impact, medium, low, or high. Uh, so these are just examples, but we would be looking at public information. Is that a high impact, medium impact, or low, high in, uh, impact? And it may be dependent on the organization. If we are looking at an asset, is there a high exposure, medium exposure, low exposure? So we have to look at the impact of the different types of assets and categorize them. Here is a simple risk analysis worksheet. We're looking at assets first, 
That would then dictate security issues, the risk of those issues, the impact of those issues, the level of risk, the appropriate controls for measurement, the priority of those controls, and any comments. That way, we could then identify all of our assets and all of the potential security concerns of those assets. And again, I mean, you would use this simple risk analysis worksheet to, to build out. So like security issues you would identify and, and you'd work down the worksheet. Next, we have things like our compliance issues. Compliance issues can be documented on the same worksheet. The compliance requirements include those imposed by the organization through security policies or the industry or government regulations or accreditation standards and so forth. The compliance should be rated as, you know, uh, normally 0 through 4, could be 0 through 5, really depending on the organization, but basically not implemented, partially implemented, implemented but not yet documented, implemented and documented, and sometimes there's a review and audit function as well. But a huge part of this is going through and making sure all of your compliance requirements are actually verified and documented. The Open Group is a global consortium of 5, 000, or 500 member organizations that enable the achievement of business objectives through IT-based standards. A huge part of that is following the factor analysis for information risk, that's the FAIR category. It is an important contribution to risk assessments, first introduced in uh, early 2005. FAIR, which is standardized the, uh, by the Open Group, has received wide acceptance. It is not the only one, but thus the FAIR does provide more specification guidance than you would have found in like the ISO 005 area. And again, here is our FAIR assessment. We have our risk identification, we have our loss event frequency and our probable loss magnitude, and they work through the systems. And again, this is just a brief overview of these tools. This is not an in-depth review. So for the FAIR, the key definitions are asset, risk, threat, vulnerability. And again, it's the same variation that we've been going through with all of the other examples. Identifying risk, identifying assets, identifying threats to those assets, and then identifying the vulnerabilities of those assets. So likelihood assessment is just that, the process of developing some sort of agreed upon likelihood score so that we could then prioritize or rank them. So here we have our loss magnitude, event frequency, threat capability, resistance, and secondary loss probability. And we rank them very low, low, medium, high, very high. And again, we can have these more standardized. And in this example, we are agreeing to the fair risk assessment levels. So while some other things like ISO 27005 or other ISO documents give you limited guidance, here within the FAIR structure, they provide a little bit better guidance for our classification of very low, low, medium, high, very high, and then kind of what magnitudes and which areas we would then have to measure. Some of these, again, are going to be more seasoned by professionals. Things like estimating threat event frequency. So there's an assessment of threat event frequency that would involve two main things. Determine the appropriate frequency and the probability. And you can be looking at historical trends, but that doesn't really mean that those things could have actually occurred. So you have to kind of take that with a grain of salt. This is a great way to do your estimates, but... Keep in mind that may not always be the correct course of action. So contacts can also be physical or logical, uh, physical access, logical access via things like uh, network access, 
Uh, contact can even be unplanned or randomized. It really just depends. Physical access is typically done through an insider. The task of a security analyst is to come up with a reasonable estimate. And reasonable is super subjective, so that's not as easy to find either. And normally that means defining five levels of frequency and then categorizing using those five. The next task is to determine the probability or likelihood that the threat agent will actually take action. So that means estimating vulnerability. Two dimensions of vulnerabilities are things like fair, and it will need to be expressed relatively to some type of baseline. Estimating vulnerability will look like skills and resources. The knowledge and experience for a threat agent to critically factor in severity of the threat actions. Skills are reflected in the experience, case of malware, and the resources. Again, does your team have the appropriate resources? So here we have estimating the vulnerabilities. The dimensions of the control strengths, that's going to be the resistance or difficulty the appropriate approaches to the levels of resistance, the purpose of the control and the increased complexity of the control, and the greater the capability and the threat agent must have to overcome to have the appropriate security controls in place. So these dimensions are all around the vulnerability in control strength. Here we have an example of a fair risk assessment matrix looking at risk, vulnerabilities, uh, loss frequency, and primary risk. And then again, based off of certain matrices. Here we have a matrix for likelihood assessment skills. And again, we have a quantitative value identifying what range we, we would be classifying as low, very low, moderate, high, and very high. And then again, the likelihood of those events and kind of the threats that would occur because of that. Here we have an example of fair loss categories, primary and secondary loss, and the loss factors. And again, ISO 27005 and other documentations provide very limited uh, guidance on these, but the fair document provides at least a little bit better value. Huh. Which brings us to the value proposition. And this is a statement that identifies clearly measurable and demonstrative benefits to consumers when they buy a particular product or service. When you buy this product, these are the measurable goals or benefits from this product. What this may protect you from, for example. So estimating both primary and secondary loss is kind of important. Primary loss would be looking at the fair impact, as it refers to loss, looking at asset factor and threat factor, looking at access, misuse, disclosure, modification, and things like denial access. The secondary would be estimating uh, losses way more complex. We're looking at factors like magnitude and frequency. So estimating loss magnitude would be the analysis of magnitude based off of uh, the analyst determines the nature of the threat, organizational factors, external factors. The frequency would be looking at frequency probability and frequency event frequency. And again, categorizing very low to very high and ranking them based off of unforeseen, delay, loss of customers, confidence, and reputation. And here we're looking at example of business impact. Again, customers, productivity, and other. And again, these are not hard set or fast areas. Like these can be modified to fit the individual organization requirements. We're going into risk determination. And again, once you've looked at risk magnitude or loss magnitude, and you've estimated it, then you can slowly start getting into 
our risk for primary, and that would be the primary loss event frequency and loss magnitude. And the same would be for calculating overall risk. That would be the primary risk and secondary risk. All of this helps to determine the appropriate level of risk for the organization. That means we can then start comparing and evaluating risk and the results of the risk analysis against the evaluation criteria. The ISO does make a distinction between risk evaluation criteria and risk acceptance criteria because they are slightly different. Within the, uh, the NIST 800-100 provides the general guidelines for high, moderate, and low observations. Here we have our risk treatment. We have our risk and our residual risk, and we look at ways to reduce, retain, avoid, or transfer our risks. Those are the main categories. We're probably most familiar with risk transference, i.e. insurance. Uh, we also have risk reduction, which is ways to mitigate or minimize risk to a more acceptable limit. Risk avoidance is to avoid risky behavior. And risk retention is basically acceptance of that risk. At the end of the day, the goal here is to find the, identify your assets, identify the exposure, the threat, the vulnerability, and the risk to those assets so that you could find ways to reduce risk. So risk reduction is achieved by applying the appropriate controls, figuring out what threats are out there and mitigating them, removing them the best you can or changing the likelihood that they can be exploited. Changing the likelihood of a vulnerability, a vulnerability being recognized, or changing the ability or the consequences of a security event. So there are plenty of different ways to reduce risk. We also have things like risk retention, that's just sometimes accepting. Risk avoidance, that's just uh, avoiding certain situations, if it's too risky, you just don't do it. You avoid the risk altogether. Risk transfer, that's again more of the insurance. Push it off to a third party. So risk assessment best practices. There are breakdowns for best practices in two areas and 12 uh, topics that provide detailed checklists. We have our risk assessment framework we have our assessment process and again these are broken down into management and methodology this is down for supporting material looking at scope looking at impact assessment looking at uh, confidentiality integrity availability threat profiling vulnerability assessment, risk evaluation, risk treatment, and so forth. So again, the end goal of risk assessments are to identify risk so we can find ways to mitigate and minimize risk. All right, so that is it for this chapter. We've looked at understanding the methodologies for identifying various types of assets, explaining stride, presenting an overview of vulnerability identification techniques, combination of risk assessment types, quantitative versus qualitative, explain and explore FAIR, expand the key elements of risk uh, analysis, explain the major options for risk treatment, and present an overview of risk assessment best practices. That is it for this chapter. So this concludes our lecture review on this book. Questions, concerns, or thoughts Leave a comment, make a statement, get a hold of me. If you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. Remember that when we do some of this, it is critical that we ensure that we're answering your questions. Don't just listen and don't try to apply. Listen, try to apply what we've been discussing, and when possible, if you're not understanding something, say something.